And uh, that's just uh, wonderful to have uh, such a treasure here, really, at, uh, that Herbert Hoover was born here in Iowa, and we have a president right here in, uh, from Iowa. And I do uh, want to talk about there's really three main, uh, especially Laura Ingalls Wilder places to go visit here in Iowa. One is right here. Um, you might not be aware, but uh, Laura Ingalls Wilder and her husband Almanzo had a daughter named Rose Wilder Lane, and she was a uh, famous author in her own right, and she wrote actually the first biography of Hoover, and she had no living children of her own, and so when she died and uh, she passed the things to her heir, Roger Lee McBride, then he needed a place to put her papers from her writings, which also included her mother, uh, Laura Ingalls Wilder's writings, since she was the only child of Laura Ingalls Wilder. And so in the archives here at the Herbert Hoover Museum, there are Laura's, a lot of Laura's original documents, um, letters, uh, Rose Wilder Lane's books, and just wonderful, and even visitors can go see them if, if you'd like, which is just absolutely amazing. And also then, um, if you look at your green paper that you might have gotten at the front door, Laura Ingalls Wilder has a lot of home sites. Uh, almost every place that Ingalls live, there is a museum. That you can, and you can find that information on there. It says beyondlittlehouse.com for the information. Um, then the next one I have is um, about Pepin, Wisconsin. But actually, um, let me talk about Iowa again. Um, the next place in Iowa you could go see is in Burr Oak, Iowa. That's uh, just north of Decorah, so it's northeast Iowa. And uh, Laura did not write a book about the Ingalls time living in Iowa. It was kind of a sad time for the family. The, um, her brother had just died and things like that. They're kind of traveling east. But there, there is a festival up there and it's a wonderful museum where they um, had their, they helped to run the hotel that is a museum now. The third place in Iowa is actually in Vinton, Iowa. Um, Laura's sister, Mary, did become blind uh, and um, she, went to kind of like high school, college up at Vinton, and they have, uh, it's the Iowa Braille and Sight Saving School now, but they have a whole thing about Laura up there, and they even have a pageant that usually goes on in the beginning of August. And then also, sorry to <laughs> mention uh, all these, but um, like I said, then Pepin, Wisconsin, that is the birthplace of Laura Ingalls Wilder. It's in the southwest part of Wisconsin. Uh, it's a little house in the big woods, and they have a festival every year in September. And I actually happen to be the coordinator for the activities at the Little House in the Big Woods cabin for children and adults during that weekend. So it's, a, it's just a wonderful time to go visit uh, and uh, things like that. If you're, and then if you're really interested in Laura, there's a conference called Laura Palooza. And you can go to beyondlittlehouse.com to learn about that. And they're on Facebook. And that's totally awesome. And then I always want to point out about um, some of the books that we have. Um, first of all, like uh, Tom said, um, William Anderson will be coming and speaking here on September 5th. Labor Day is usually the Laura Ingalls Wilder remembered at Herbert Hoover. So, uh, and they sometimes they have prairie walks there too, sometimes on that day. And last year Pamela Smith Hill came, which was wonderful. And uh, but. William Anderson just wrote, uh, helped edit this book called The Selected Letters of Laura Ingalls Wilder. That's a wonderful read. And if you want to read that one, especially if you've already read this one, Pamela Smith Hill is the one that edited this Pioneer Girl. Uh, Laura Ingalls Wilder wrote this book, Pioneer Girl, kind of before she wrote the regular books. And this has become a bestseller now, if you know about that. And then I also... Um, let's see, then we have books about Iowa here. Um, one is another William Anderson book, which, by the way, a lot of these are in the gift shop here, is called The Iowa Story. And William Anderson wrote this book, and it's all about the Ingalls' time here in Iowa. And then, boy, a lot of people don't know about this one, and so sorry, sorry again to go on and on about these things, but if you read the Little House in the Prairie series, which people usually call it the Little House in the Prairie, if you're thinking of the TV show, the TV show is nice. It's a, it's a wonderful show, and it was very popular, but you have to know it's only five, about 5% 5 true or so. A lot of people ask me that a lot, uh, a lot of times. It's, it's, but if you start out reading the books, which I highly suggest, of course, especially for children, but adults too, the first book is Little House in the Big Woods. 
And so you start off with that. And if you read the rest of the series, then I always recommend that people don't really know about this because it's fairly new, but after you read On the Banks of Plum Creek when they're in Walnut Grove, you need to try to read this book. This book is called Old Town in the Green Groves, and it's by Cynthia Ryland, who's a famous uh, children's author. <coughs> and it's, about, it's a fictional story that she wrote about the Ingalls time in Iowa. And so it kind of fits in with the rest of the series. So it's very, very nice that they have that now. And then one more thing I want to mention. Um, the music that you heard coming in is also in the gift shop. It's called From the Parlor to the Prairie. It's a nice CD by Valerie Coates. And it has a, muse, a lot of the music from uh, the Little House books. And there are a lot of CDs and things that I just love music, of course. And there's a lot of CDs. And the other one that we're going to hear pretty soon is from the CD called Happy Land uh, when we get to that. And actually, I think we'll maybe, can we listen to that now, please? Uh, the, we're going to listen to a song called Uncle Sam is Rich Enough to Give Us All a Farm. And like I said, it's from this Happy Land CD that's uh, by, uh, by Paz Fiddle Band. And I want you to listen to the words because it talks about um, getting a homestead and coming to America. Yeah, so that song again was called Uncle Sam's Farm, and it was actually written in about 1950. Can you believe that long ago? Oh, 1950. Excuse me, 1850. Even longer ago. 
1850 to kind of entice people to come to America. So isn't that neat? Okay, so now I have um, a question for you all. Um, how many people like uh, have read the Little House in the Prairie book series by Lauren Ingalls Wilder, or maybe one or two books? Okay, very good. And how many of you grew up on a farm or live on one right now? Okay, very good. And so um, raise your hand. Anybody now own a century farm? I suppose besides my <laughs> that are here. I have a lot of family members. Are there, is there anybody? Oh, just stars. Okay. Um, so that's okay. Even if you did not grow up on a farm, I think some of you might have experienced what it might have been like through reading the Little House books by Laura Ingalls Wilder. Those of us who did grow up on a farm were possibly drawn into the stories due to similarities in our own lives. This was definitely the way it happened for me. So if you did grow up on a farm or live on one right now, I think you might enjoy the stories I have to tell you and you can compare them to your own life. And if you didn't grow up on a farm and you were a town girl or boy, hopefully you will learn a little bit about life, what life was like for us country girls. Just so you know, not all farm families grew up with the same experiences, chores, and play, pe play times, but this is what happened in my life. I lived my whole childhood on a farm near Gowrie, Iowa, which is in northwest Iowa in Webster County. It's 20 miles south of Fort Dodge. I grew up in the 70s and 80s. Over and over, growing up, my four siblings and I were told the stories of our family heritage. My great-grandfather, Warner Larson, at the age of 20, immigrated to America from Sweden in 1892 through Ellis Island. And here's a picture of my great-grandpa Warner about the time he came to America. The story goes that Warner's mother was so sad that he was leaving that she took to her bed for two weeks before he left. She thought that she would never see him again, and she never did. His mother baked five loads of bread for Warner to take, and with a few dollars in his pocket, packed a small trunk of clothes and left to discover his American dream. And this is, this is Warner's trunk. Great grandpa's there. And I have a closer up picture that you can see. That um, I'm assuming the W in the left is maybe for Warner. And then there's Larson, spelled with two S's, which is not usually, but that's okay. And then interesting at the bottom, it says uh, Webster. And then below it says Iowa, Iowa with a V. And then it says, I mean, because he's coming over from Sweden, I suppose. So, and then it says North America, North America, with a K, on the uh, bottom right there. Wouldn't it have been something to sail into Ellis Island and see the Statue of Liberty? Warner eventually took the train to Iowa, worked on a couple of other farms near ours, met and married my great grandmother Amanda and bought the original 80 acres of our farm in 1900. They were the first people to live on that piece of land and still early settlers in the area. It eventually became a prosperous farm of 200 acres and it was so successful that they were later able to purchase much more cropland than that. And here's uh, my great grandpa as, as he was older. And then um, this is his uh, citizenship paper, which is displayed out front, actually, if you would like to see it close up. Oh, please don't touch it, by the way. Um, but um, in 1900, he became a citizen. And then it's kind of interesting because I'll try this thing here. Right there, they had to change it to, it wasn't 1800 anymore, it was 1900. They had to cross it out and fix that. Warner and his wife, Amanda, eventually had six living children, many of which were born in our house, which was built in 1900. And here's the picture of the old house, maybe taken in the early 30s or so, 1930s. And then this is what the house looks like today. I can't help but wonder if my great-grandpa ever heard the song, Uncle Sam's Farm. But he must have been motivated to come to America and try to live out his dream, because even I just feel that pioneer spirit in my blood today. 
16 years ago, my family was proud to have been presented with a Century Farm Award. And here's my family receiving the Century Farm Award at the State Fair. And this is our uh, crop field from last fall with the Century Farm sign. A Century Farm consists of a piece of land at least 40 acres in size, owned by the same family for 100 or more years. In Iowa, this award is sponsored by the Iowa Department of Agriculture and Land Stewardship in conjunction with the Iowa Farm Bureau Federation. Between 1976 and 2015, there have been 18,698 families in Iowa given the Century Farm Award. Now, a heritage farm is one that is 150 years old, and now in Iowa, there are 837 of those. So that's, that's really outstanding. Our Century Farm was even one of those to be lived on by the same family for 100 years or more. First, my great-grandparents lived there. Then their son, Bernard, my grandfather, lived there, along with my grandmother, Frances, who I'm named after. My middle name is Frances. Then my mom grew up and lived on our farm. And this is my grandpa and grandma, Bernard and Francis. And then here are my parents on the farm, and they happen to be in attendance today with our, in front of our farm. I am sure that if the Ingalls happened to have stayed on the same farm for 100 or more years, they would have also been proud to be called a Century Farm, as those families who hold that title around America are today. When you own, work on, and live on a piece of farmland for that long, it becomes part of you, and you develop a deep love and pride of the land. And here's my uh, Grandpa Bernard again. In fact, my Grandpa Bernard always used to say, I was born on this land, and I will die on this land. And sure enough, at the age of 62, he died of a sudden heart attack in our field. Like some of you might have done, I started reading the Little House books when I was in the third grade. Imagine my shock when I discovered so many similarities from the books to my own life. Laura's sister was named Mary. What? My only sister is named Mary. And we were and are still close friends, and Mary happens to be here too today. And this is a picture of Mary and I. And Marry me, and I am standing in the red dress. I thought that was interesting if you're a Laura fan. I'm standing and I'm in the red dress, and then Mary is sitting down and she's wearing a blue dress. Just happened to be that way. On our farmland, we grow seed corn and soybeans. Now, most of you know that uh, not all of Iowa is flat, but our farm is on some of the flattest land I've ever seen. For miles and miles, you can see farms and good cropland due to the flat land and very, very black, rich soil. It is very enjoyable, very peaceful to look over the land or to even watch a sunset. Also, we had two acres of real prairie that had never been plowed right on our farm. We called it the pasture. So I could look out our house windows and literally see through Laura's eyes out to the wildflowers and everything. We even had wild roses, just as Laura and her husband, Almanzo, saw near De Smith. And yes, like I said, his, na his name is really pronounced Almanzo. The wild rose happens to be the state flower of Iowa. And here's a picture of the wild rose. Laura and Almanzo named their only daughter Rose, and who was also their only child. We also had a lot of milkweed and lots of butterflies as well. For a short time, we had cattle in the pasture, but most of the time it was left alone to grow, and then it was cut and put into square hay bales. And this is a picture of Luke and me in our uh, prairie, our pasture. And Luke's here today. He's seven now in the back. Mm -hmm. That's a, but you can see even here, uh, this was, oh, the end of May, and already the grasses are up high, pretty, pretty high. Have you ever actually walked through a real prairie? I encourage each of you to try it sometime. An 81-acre prairie has been planted on these grounds, which are, you are free to tour actually at any time. 
A guided prairie walk by the National Park Service will start today at 1230. Each section of the country has different kind of prairie with different kinds of grasses and wildflowers. So it is interesting to see all the varieties. I have memories of getting thorns stuck in my legs. Even while walking through a prairie, your feet will probably get stuck in all the varieties of grasses sticking up in all different directions. The best way to walk is to literally pick up your feet high for every step. Ever try run, to run through a prairie? Even harder, but fun. The best way is to kick your feet up high and to the side while running. I really do encourage you to try walking or running through a prairie to experience what the Ingalls girls did. But be careful to only walk or run through a prairie where it is allowed to do so. Here on the Herbert Hoover grounds, there's a nice grass walking path through the prairie. Next, talk about shocking similarity. But I, when I read about Laura's father getting the homestead in the book By the Shores of Silver Lake near DeSmet, South Dakota, my jaw dropped because the words, the homestead, were printed in big letters on our barn, which was built in 1923, and on also one of our silos. And this is our barn. And here's the words, the homestead. Even though my great grandpa did not technically get the land through the Homestead Act, the fact that those words were also on our buildings was quite impressive. To me, those words are so special to me because even today, they remind me that my family was living on the original 80 acres of land. And by the way, that was our picture of our barn. This is a picture of our silos. If you have been traveling around Iowa and have been thinking, what are those tall, skinny things next to the buildings on these farms? Those are called silos. And then they can be different colors. Here's our red silo from our farm. In the past, silos were used for storing grain, which is really called silage. And it could have been also a system for feeding animals near the bottom of the silo. These days, silos are mostly not used. So now you know what those are. If you have read the Little House books, some of you might feel more similar to Laura than to her sister Mary. But I have always felt more like Mary. I was the older <coughs> sister, I have blonde hair, I love to quilt and sew, I would rather stay inside, I learned to play the piano, I like to keep clean, and I became a teacher like Mary always wanted to do. Sometimes I could even be a bit of a tattletale. Another similarity to pioneer life, Laura never mentioned it in the books, but we had a real outhouse on our farm. And there it is. And it's not just a normal outhouse, it's a two-seater. <laughs> we never used it, but still, it was always there and still stands today. That's what happens when you use strong bricks instead of wood to build it with. Built to last. What about chores? No, our family did not follow that every day has a special chore like Laura wrote about in Little House in the Big Woods as in wash on Monday. Basically, as in the books, the girls of our family did most of the inside chores, while my two older brothers did most of the outside chores. Most of the time, our farm had up to 500 hogs and about 20 sheep. Here are the sheep on our farm. These were almost fully grown animals because Dad never wanted to have to take care of baby animals on our farm. And no, we never did our own butchering like Laura's pa and ma did, thank heavens. For some years, we had some beef cattle and maybe a couple of horses. And look at this picture. This is from our farm. These are horses in front of the barn in 1925. We also always had a border collie, mainly to help with the hogs and sheep. There were a lot of stray animals on our farm too. Cats, rabbits, squirrels, pheasants, once in a while, something like a turtle or a wild turkey. Surprisingly, one year on Thanksgiving morning, we saw a wild turkey to the east of our house in the pasture. Usually, there was even a family of raccoons who liked to live in one of our hollow trees. There's a picture of one of the raccoon families. 
I'm, I'm not kidding you. <laughs> now listen to this. There were a lot of summers where if you looked outside the east window of our house right at 8.15 p.m., you would see first a mother raccoon come out of the hollow tree, look around to check things out, and then about six or seven baby raccoons would come following her, marching down the tree and walking single file across our yard. I think they wanted to find supper in our field, which might be breakfast for them, I guess. My dad and brothers took care of the animals and did the outside chores, while us girls helped with the dishes, cleaned the house, and helped to cook things. Mary and I usually had a schedule put in place by mom, of which person was to set the table and help with dishes and when to dust and vacuum and such. We did most of the dishes by hand, which actually ended up being a good time to talk one-on-one -on -one with mom. Sometimes we had to work along with the boys to do a chore like picking up sticks or sorting the basement or deep cleaning our bedrooms. And even the boys would have to help with a job inside the house once in a while. Sometimes when us kids got into trouble, doing an extra outside chore was used as a punishment. That's what it was like. Kids fighting, too wild. Kids just need to get out of the house. Then go outside and do some work. Oh, how us kids hated to do extra assigned jobs like that. But somehow a bit of physical labor did the trick. And once, about once a month or so, my dad would make me go outside to help with an outside chore with the animals, which was usually the hogs, even though I was not in trouble and was not one of my usual jobs. I hear some hogs there. <laughs> Out in the hog lot, you had to wear boots. Since I didn't have any chore boots, I had to wear one of my brother's extra pairs, which were way too big for me. Do you know what happened? I was walking in the hog lot and the big boots made me literally fall face first into the manure. <laughs> Remember how I told you that I was more like Mary and I like to keep clean? Yeah, that was pretty disgusting. I think Dad actually felt sorry for me right after that and sent me inside so I didn't have to work in the mess that day. Other times in the hot lot, it was kind of scary because we had to use these big wooden boards to help sort or move the hogs. You had to hold the board down by your legs. It was scary because when you have a fully grown 230 pound hog running at you, it really hurts when it knocks into your board and then it hits you. I guess a couple of times my youngest brother even got knocked down from the back by a hog. In addition, many times we used the really old hand water pump that was on our farm to fill buckets, wash our hands outside, and things like that. It still works today. And here's our hand pump and there's uh, our son Luke uh, pumping it by the barn. The pump was always kind of like a connection to Pa as I thought about his well that he dug in Kansas from the book Little House on the Prairie. And oh, how I could identify with Mary and Laura's trying to learn how to sew. All of us kids were in 4-H, and a lot of you know how that goes. The county fair is coming up, and you started your projects too late, and you need to get them done and done well, and you sew something so fast that you make mistakes. My mom made us fix every one. So if one of your seams wasn't straight or we did something wrong, we'd have to do it all over again. Thank heavens we had a 1948 Singer electric sewing machine and didn't have to do everything by hand, though. I guess we were like Almanzo in the book Farmer Boy with his pumpkin at the fair. Our persistence paid off a few times with blue ribbons, so it was a good lesson to learn. I eventually learned how to sew clothes following a pattern and learned to do latch hook, cross stitch, needlepoint, and to quilt. Today I love to make quilts, especially very small miniature ones. Quilting is yet another Laura connection for me. And here's one of the quilts that I've made. It's in a barn wood frame. It's a nine patch, like uh, Mary and Laura first started out, but this is in miniature. And this is, I love to make a small, you see that's a penny there um, with the, in the quilt there. You might be wondering what kind of fun we had on the farm. Inside, Mary and I played with dolls, played hopscotch in the basement, and all us kids played a lot of ping pong as well as card games and board games together. 
And this is a picture of my dog Natalie, and she's here visiting today, growing up. Um, she was kind of like my Charlotte. And here I am with Natalie when I was a young little girl. I think it was my third birthday or something like that, and I had gotten, my, right mom, third or fourth, something like that. And I'd gotten Natalie, I think, for my first birthday from uh, gra my grandma, Frances Larson. Outside, we swung on our swings, played in our sandbox made from a big tractor tire, played games like baseball and frisbee and keep away as a family, and also climbed trees a lot. And here's a picture of Mary and me in the tree. Mary's up high and then I'm down below. I even remember reading books up in the trees. We spent so much time up there. In our barn's hayloft, square bales of straw were stacked like huge stair steps, the whole width of the barn, all the way to the ceiling. This was a great number of stairs and a great number of bales. Our parents used to let us kids climb all the way to the top. Then we would kind of jump down each step on our bottoms until we got to the floor. You know, don't, don't. It was a lot of fun. And then this is our barn, I and mean, you can see, I mean, there's the, the white doors there, and then the rest is all the hay mow, so that that whole length would be the hay bales clear up to the top there. Especially if you were a boy growing up on a farm, one of the basic things to do was, of course, sit on the tractor. And here's my youngest brother, Dennis, sitting on tractor, which he's here today, too. He's probably about, I don't know, three or something like that. But that's what little boys love to do, and girls too, but... And then uh, here's a close-up of Dennis on the tractor. In the book, On the Banks of Plum Creek, in the chapter called Straw Stack, Laura and Mary had so much fun sliding down Pa's stack of wheat. Then they were told not to slide, oh, but instead they rolled. And they got in trouble for that, kind of. In the book, Laura writes, they had never had so much fun. Let me tell you about the most fun on the farm us kids ever had. We had an old wooden shed out on the edge of the pasture that had a rusty tin roof on it. And this is a picture of the shed. Now this, this picture was taken a few years before it was um, torn down. It was you know several years af after uh, we had grown up. It wasn't really used that much for anything anymore. It was that run down and old, as you can kind of tell from the picture still. Well, one time when I was about eight years old, I went walking out there to see what my brother, older brothers were doing. My oldest brother was sitting on the roof of the shed. So I asked them what they were doing, and they said, don't tell mom. And they told me that they were sliding off the roof of the shed. Mom was a especially strict with rules and did not let us get, let her, let us get out of their, her sight very much. I knew we'd be in trouble if she found out. I was basically the most behaved one of the family and didn't like to get into trouble. My brother said I could slide off the roof if I didn't tell mom. And just like Laura and Mary at the straw stack, it looked too tempting to not do. I climbed the fence post that was near the corner of the shed, and then my brother helped me to climb the top of the shed's roof. The hot summertime sun was shining down on us, and boy, how I could feel that heat on my backside. So scared as I was that first time to slide down, it was so hot that I started sliding right away. Then at the bottom of the roof, it was about a five foot drop to the ground. You had to bend your knees landing, or your feet would really hurt. But what fun, I just had to do it again, even though I knew I'd be in huge trouble if mom found out. You had to be careful too, because once in a while our, sh our shorts would rip on a rusty nail, and then we'd have to make up a story to tell mom <laughs> about how we ripped our shorts. At least our tennis shots were up to date. <laughs> Sometimes you would also get scratched from the rusty nails. Um, did I mention not to try this at home? Um, yeah, boys and girls that are here, too dangerous. Don't climb on the roof of a shed. Again and again that summer and the next, the three of us took turns sliding down. It really was the most fun us kids ever had on our farm. Mom and Dad never did find out until years later when Dad and my youngest brother tore down the shed. I now look back and think, 
how all us kids were fortunate to have such a good childhood. Going to school, going to church, spending a lot of family time together talking and playing, working hard to get a job done right, sharing the stories of our family heritage. That was basically how life was like growing up on our farm. And uh, this is a picture of my relatives. Right there, there's my great-grandpa Warner and his wife Amanda and their six surviving children. Since none of my siblings or I became farmers or married farmers, yes, sorry, my parents could no longer keep up with taking care of the farm and moved to the nearby small town of Gowrie in 2010. And sadly, four years ago, my family sold the 12 acres of land where the buildings were although we still own 188 acres of cropland. It was one of the hardest decisions my parents and siblings and I ever had to make to sell part of the farm. But that's what it's like all over Iowa and America now. Families have to make very hard decisions about whether to keep the land, to pass it on to a new generation, to fix the buildings, or to sell it. I'd like to thank the Herbert Hoover Presidential Library and Museum for allowing me to give this presentation because I feel it is kind of like some sort of consolation for my ancestors, especially when given the fact that I, along with other members of our family, promised them that we would never sell the land. It means very much to me and to our family. I'd like to end my presentation with a quote from Laura Ingalls Wilder. Things of real value do not change with the passing of years, nor in going from one country to another. It is always best to be honest and truthful, to make the most of what we have, to be happy with simple pleasures, to be cheerful in adversity, and have courage in danger. Uh, thank you. I got lots of people otherwise too to thank and before I forget outside on the table there's some brochures about Pepin and Baroque and um, if you if you want to uh, get some of those um, but I'd like to thank like I said the Herbert Hoover Presidential Library and Museum for letting me give this of course it's of great import importance to me and our family to be sharing this um, and also the National Park Service for doing the Prairie Walk and a lot of my family members are here and and um, and friends, and uh, my husband Mike and Luke, and and uh, everybody that helped with this presentation, they're just so supportive and everything. So, um, I wondered if any anybody has any questions. Oh. Which Laura site is your favorite? Oh dear, which Laura site is my favorite? Oh. They're, they're all real special, and actually I haven't been to Mansfield yet. That's like the big mothership or whatever some people call it. No, I think I have more of a connection actually to the two of them. Burr Oak is really special because it's in Iowa. Of course, I'm from Iowa. Um, and I've helped out at the festival there too. Um, this summer they're going to be having a festival on June 21st, uh, 25th. And then I also love, I think it's I love Pepin too because... The Little House of the Big Woods, because I, I help out there. You know, being involved with it, I think, makes it more special. Okay, anybody else? Yes? Is your barn design from Sweden, or is it something local to the gallery area? Oh, boy, good question. I would think it would be local, but I, we're not sure on that one. Good question, now. Yeah. And let me know if you can't hear the questions. So I'll repeat them. We were wondering what was school like. How did you go to school on the farm? Oh, how did we go to school? Well, um, my siblings and I, we did attend um, the, the public school in the area, which was technically like basically three different towns. So we rode the bus to school. The, the elementary was in one town, and then I went to middle school at, at a different town, and then Gowrie was the high school. That was that, does that answer your question? Yeah. Okay, any more? Do you think that due to economics and changing society that someday century farms will be no more? Oh boy, well, I kind of hate to think of that. Um, I don't know. 
because what would happen? I mean, even if the buildings weren't there, the land would still be there. So who would own it unless the government would take it away? Or, I don't know what it would happen. You know, wouldn't, that, wouldn't you think that'd be 100, 200 years in the future or something? Oh, I, I, would, I would hope to think that Century Farms would always be around. Or Heritage or whatever. What would the buy, you know, 200 years? Whatever they would call those. Okay, anyone else? Okay. Well, um, I, uh, I will uh, play the piano then for you a little bit now. And some of these songs are kind of special uh, related to... Um, Lauren goes wilder and, th and things like that, and um, I'll come over here and talk about each one. Well, if you grew up in Iowa, raise your hand if um, you learned the Iowa corn song. Did you learn the Iowa corn song? It go, you know, we're from Iowa, Iowa, state of all the land, joy on every hand. We're from Iowa, Iowa, that's where the tall corn grows. Okay, so I'm going to have everybody sing that song. Are you ready? Yeah. Yeah, you're ready? Okay, let's see.
do have to uh, thank, before I forget, I have to thank uh, West Music for um, letting us use this piano here. Um, I will play you, uh, I think, one more selection. And it is called The Sweet By and By. And this was Pa's favorite hymn and also one of Laura's favorite hymns. And Pa wanted it played at his funeral. He loved it so much. Um, also, if you've ever been to um, Desmet, South Dakota, that's where five of the books were written and Laura and Almanzo got married and things. Um, they have, Pa built a house called uh, on 3rd Street and they have a pump organ and this last summer I was uh, honored to play the Sweet By and By on the pump organ while people sang and he, we knew that he had died in the next room and that kind of thing. So, and those videos are on YouTube and my Facebook page and whatever. But, but this is um, the Sweet By and By um, arranged by Mark Hayes. <laughs> 